major update just dropped around Ukraine's Checkmate Dita self-propelled howitzer, and if you've been treating this system like a niche footnote, you're missing what it actually represents on a drone-saturated battlefield. Because Dita isn't a WoW weapon, it's not designed to win Twitter, it's designed to win tomorrow and the day after that by keeping crews alive long enough to keep firing, and in 2026 style artillery warfare, survival isn't a bonus feature, it's the core spec. Here's the key trigger. Ukraine's state border guard service publicly showcased Dita in its inventory and emphasized the same things any artillery unit obsessed with staying alive would emphasize. Automation, modern fire control, and a workflow where the operator inputs coordinates and the system handles the calculation, loading, and aiming. Two-person crew, automated turret, used against Russian forces at the front. That combination tells you where Dita sits in Ukraine's force structure right now. Not in theory, not in marketing, but in operational reality. It's fielded, it's integrated, and it's being talked about in the language of process and survivability, not glamour. So what is DITA really? DITA is a wheeled 155mm self-propelled howitzer built by Excalibur Army in the Czech Republic, built around a fully automated turret mounted on a Tatra 8x8 chassis. That sounds like brochure talk until you translate it into battlefield logic. What does fully automated turret mean when drones are overhead and counter-battery timelines are measured in minutes, sometimes seconds? It means fewer exposed human steps. It means the difference between a gun crew working outside the vehicle, loading, setting, adjusting, moving around the system, and a crew that can stay protected while the machine does the dangerous part fast. This is where people underestimate Dita. They hear unmanned turret and think it's just a neat engineering flex, but on a modern front, it's a survival feature disguised as a technical detail. Traditional artillery creates predictable moments, crew outside, gun busy, process slow, silhouettes visible, patterns repeat. Those moments are exactly what Russian drones and counter-battery assets are built to exploit. So ask yourself a blunt question. In a war where being seen is often the same thing as being targeted, why would you choose an artillery workflow that forces humans to stand next to the gun at the worst possible time? Dita is built to collapse that exposure window. The crew stays in the armored cab. Coordinates go in. The system computes, loads, and lays the gun. The round goes out. Then you move. That's not a cinematic story, but it's the story that keeps units intact. Because in artillery, time isn't money, time is blood. Lose time and you pay for it in casualties, vehicles, and lost guns. Now let's talk about the other half of the survivability equation, mobility. Dita rides on wheels, not tracks. And in Ukraine, that matters more than armchair debates usually admit. First, wheels are fast on roads. And Ukraine's geography and logistics reality still makes roads decisive across large stretches of the theater. Second, Wheeled systems generally impose a different maintenance burden than tracked ones, often simpler in some respects, at a time when spare parts and repair cycles are under constant pressure. Third, the shoot and scoot meta isn't a slogan, it's a necessity. Russian drones and radars thrive on routine. Fire, linger, get bracketed, get chased, get suppressed, get hit. The units that survive are the ones that break the rhythm and refuse to be predictable. Dita's design philosophy supports that. Arrive fast, fire fast, leave fast. On paper, Excalibur's published specs describe a maximum range around 39 kilometers with standard NATO 155mm ammunition, and the turret carries a meaningful onboard ammunition load. Those numbers matter, but not in the way people want them to matter. Range is not a magic talisman. Rate of fire is not a victory condition. A gun that can reach far but dies after the first mission is just an expensive firework. What Ukraine needs are systems that can repeatedly generate accurate fire missions while minimizing the time they're vulnerable. And DITA is optimized for exactly that repetitive high-tempo survival loop. This is why the procurement story matters so much. The Netherlands publicly stated it ordered nine DITA howitzers for Ukraine delivered in the summer and then ordered six more, bringing the total to 15. That's not random generosity, that's a signal. Countries don't double down on platforms that can't integrate, can't survive, or can't deliver measurable value. A follow-on order after deliveries is one of the clearest practical endorsements you can get in wartime procurement. We've seen enough to buy more. And the political industrial layer here is just as important as the hardware. Europe is not only donating, it's slowly industrializing a support pipeline. Ukraine identifies a need. European states fund purchases. European industry produces. Ukraine fields the system, adapts tactics, and feeds back what works. Then the buyer orders more based on real performance. That is what a repeatable support model looks like. Less theatrical, more durable.
Now, the part that surprised some observers is the unit context. Why is a 155 mm system showing up with Ukraine's border guard service? Because Ukraine's border guard in wartime isn't a peacetime agency checking passports. It has evolved into a fighting component in a total war environment where any capable formation gets pulled into the frontline economy of force. When that service publicly emphasizes automated precision workflow and a two-person crew model, it suggests something bigger than a single photo op. It suggests Ukraine is distributing high-end firepower deeper across the force, increasing redundancy and complicating Russia's target set. If more formations can generate serious artillery fire, Russia can't treat artillery as neatly boxed into a few specialized brigades. The problem becomes messier and messy problem sets are harder to suppress. So how does Dita actually fight in Ukraine? Not as a lone hero gun, but as a node in a kill chain. A drone or reconnaissance element finds a target. Coordinates move through the network. The crew receives the mission, inputs the data. The system handles the ballistic math and mechanical work. The gun fires and immediately the unit displaces because the moment the first round leaves the tube, a clock starts. Russian counter-battery radars can work back from trajectories. Drone teams can hunt muzzle flashes, vehicle movement and repeat firing positions. Return fire doesn't need to be perfect to be effective. It only needs to disrupt your rhythm and force you out of position. Dita is built to preserve rhythm by compressing the vulnerable part of the cycle. And there's one more quiet advantage that doesn't trend on social media, the two-person crew model. Artillery has historically been a manpower eater. Even when guns survive, units need trained crews, maintenance depth, and enough people to rotate without burning out. Reducing crew size reduces training footprint, reduces exposure per mission, and helps Ukraine allocate scarce personnel more efficiently across the force. In a long war, that matters as much as raw performance metrics. Let's be clear. Dita will not win the war by itself. It won't stop missiles. It won't erase Russia's artillery mass everywhere. But it does something strategically valuable in a war defined by sensors and attrition. It helps Ukraine generate accurate NATO standard 155 mm fires while reducing the probability that the crew gets killed for doing their job. It turns we can shoot into we can shoot again tomorrow. And that right now is the arithmetic that decides whether artillery advantages persist or evaporate under pressure. So the real update isn't just Ukraine got another howitzer. The update is that Dita is being operationally absorbed, publicly described in the language of automation and efficiency, and backed by a procurement pipeline that expanded after deliveries. Meaning it's not a science project, it's a system that proved its worth under real conditions. And in a war where drones see everything and counter-battery fire punishes hesitation like a stopwatch, a weapon that shrinks exposure time and accelerates displacement isn't just helpful, it's the direction of travel for modern artillery. And that leaves the final question. If the battlefield is turning every slow step into a liability, how many legacy systems built for a different era are going to look fine on paper right up until the moment they meet a drone overhead? Dita is one answer to that future, and Ukraine is already living in it.